Good morning. Good morning and welcome to worship. Um, some of you may know I've been working part-time recently downtown at Metropolitan United, and when I'm leading worship there and I say, welcome to M M Isl... <laughs> I always want to say Islington United, and so it's good to be here today to welcome you to Islington, whether you're here in person or joining us from home. Uh, we pray that you will experience God's peace and presence as we worship together. If you're new to Islington, uh, Scott is by, the, where is Scott? Right by the, sorry Scott. Please speak to Scott because he can connect you with Reverend Maya and James, our ministry team, and uh, it would be good for you to have a connection with them. Here at Islington United, uh, generosity has always been a key spiritual practice. And to assist that practice, the welcoming team is going to uh, hand out baskets that have offering envelopes. And for those of you joining us from home or making your offering online, there are cards that indicate that. So as we worship, I encourage you to think about how you can respond. And, and that offering will be received later. I guess the baskets can pass as, as you wish, and uh, we will begin our worship with our opening hymn, Eternal Unchanging We Sing, number 223.
Good morning. If you feel comfortable, I invite you to take a deep breath, maybe a couple of deep breaths in this moment, and feel yourself being grounded into the earth beneath the floor of this church. And on another breath, if you're comfortable, feel yourself being connected to the heavens above. For the Psalms do remind us that the gates are open wide, and as Psalm 24 says, the earth is God's. And so as we gather today, it's my privilege to lead you in the acknowledgement of territory. So we live, work, and breathe and worship on the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. And we recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations peoples, Métis and Inuit, who for time immemorial have cared for this land and welcomed those of us who call ourselves settlers as guests on this land. And just for a moment, remember, as we acknowledge this beautiful territory and our responsibilities for stewardship, that we are all treaty people and we care for this land, the waters, the animals, the creatures. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I'm Brianna. Um, if you didn't know, we're in the middle of band camp right now. We've already finished our first of our two weeks, and it's been so much fun. And we're so grateful for all of your donations, for all of our children who've needed sponsorships. Um, we've earned all the money that we need to support our children, so that is so fantastic, and we're so grateful for that. Thank you. And we'd also like to invite you to our concert that the children will be putting on for uh, everything they've been learning at band camp, which is going to be this Thursday at 6.30. So anyone who would like to come and see the concert they've been working on are welcome to join us. So thanks so much. And I'd also just like to invite the children to come downstairs now if you'd like to come for godly play or toddler ministry, anyone ages two to... 14 are welcome to come downstairs at this time. Thanks. Thanks, Brianna. <clears throat> the candles are already burning, but I want to remind you that the candles who remind us of our uh, saints who have gone before us also uh, remind us these flowers are here in memory of our Gordon Bennett, Carol Bennett's father. Gordon was well known here at Islington and he was well known throughout the province because of his involvement in the Ministry of Agriculture. I remember when we moved to Islington in 1993, I was out uh, cutting the grass one day and I saw this car slowly approach our place and there was Gordon Bennett and he said, I thought somebody with three sons would like some tickets to the Blue Jays. And so he handed these tickets out the window. And that was just a, an example of what a generous and gracious person he was. So we're thankful to remember him as well as to remember that cloud of witnesses who have gone before us, who have kept the faith and who have shown us God's love. Talking about God's love, the pickup choir is now going to share an anthem that reminds us of that.
Our responsive psalm this morning is Psalm 67. This is a psalm of blessing. I'll read the yellow text and you read the white text. Be gracious unto us, O God, and bless us, and let the light of your face shine upon us, that your ways may be known upon earth your saving power among all nations. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples righteously and guide the nations of the earth. The earth has yielded its harvest, and you, our God, have blessed us. Your blessing, O God, be upon us. May all the ends of the earth revere you. Herein lies wisdom. Thanks be to God. Now hear these ancient words from Psalm 128, a psalm of comfort. Now, hear the words from Psalm 128, a psalm of comfort. Happy is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be happy, and it shall go well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. Herein lies wisdom. Thanks be to God. Many years ago, I should have looked it up to be able to quote who it was, but some wise person said, every time we read uh, the scripture, we should also read the newspaper. The newspaper in one hand, the scripture in the other. Nowadays, it might be our uh, cell phone with our email and our scripture in the other hand. Last night when I was thinking about today, I received an email, and I'd like to share just part of it with you. 
Housing refugees in the church is not a safe or sustainable long-term solution. Despite requests for the city's help, over 300 people are still sleeping on cots in four Toronto churches. Over 30 years ago, Sister Susan Moran saw a gap in our city services and started the Out of the Cold program. It was a, to be a temporary relief for people experiencing homelessness. 30 years ago, a temporary solution. Since July, we've had over 400 asylum seekers sleeping in Toronto's churches. This is supposed to be a temporary measure. Taking people off the streets into churches was a faithful, compassionate act. But churches are not set up for safety plans, staffing, skills, or proper infrastructure to keep hundreds of people fed and housed adequately and safely. The federal government says they've given 97 million, but the city says that was money owed and they still need 60 million. The province promised it would chip in with the Canadian Ontario Housing Benefit, which would get people out of shelters and into housing. But that funding hasn't arrived yet. With people out of sight inside the churches, the political pressure to act has abated. But the danger hasn't. So we go from our email to our Bible, and we hear these words that Matthew recorded it. Before I read it, I'd just like to say, as a volunteer associate minister invited to share uh, in worship today, I so wish I was just coming to give you a, a, a sermon of love and assurance and, and guidance. But today's scripture for this 12th Sunday after Pentecost is a little bit disturbing. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But Jesus did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting at us. Jesus answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. He answered, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Herein lies wisdom. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. Amen. Hundreds of refugees waiting for funding that could help them move into the private rental market are waiting and sleeping on the street outside an office on Peter Street in downtown Toronto and in the sanctuaries and basements of four churches in our city. This is no longer a housing crisis or a homeless crisis, this is a humanitarian crisis, a huge shame. Asylum seekers sleeping on the streets as three levels of government argue over who should foot the bill. All of this was in the media and elsewhere when Toronto was considering who to vote for as mayor. If Jesus had been a candidate for mayor in the recent by-election, I think it's fair to say he would not have been a likely front runner. Nor would you describe Jesus as a, a strong candidate for Messiah, and for good reason. 
Here's a guy that nobody knows from Nazareth, a very dusty, sleepy, out of the town, insignificant place. Here's a man who was a carpenter's son, a great unknown, but who had somehow gathered a rather large uh, following. Overnight, it seems, Jesus went from Galilean preacher to national sensation, so much so that the religious leaders left Jerusalem to find Jesus out in Galilee and challenge him. Jesus had received such positive press, his tender nature. He was just kind and loving, his care for the common person, feeding the multitudes and healing the sick. So much so that some of the people thought it was a good idea to try and knock him down a few pegs, give him some negative press, and try to tarnish his image. But as you may remember, Jesus always had an answer for his critics. And somehow he managed to continue, no matter what they were doing or saying to distract him, he continued to preach about hope and love and life in the kingdom of God. Now, it's not fair to say that everyone liked his message. He was even rejected in his own hometown. But strangely, everybody listened. And no one could deny that when Jesus spoke, he spoke with an authority they had never seen before. And he could do amazing things. So many who had no hope found hope in this man named Jesus. From out of nowhere, Jesus became the hope of the nation. As Matthew and the other Gospels tell us, Jesus had been busy traveling across Galilee preaching straight talk, hope, change, because the kingdom of heaven was near. He had accepted invitations to preach in different synagogues. He had hosted meals. He had visited the sick. He had given talks on mountaintops and lake shores and spoken with political and religious leaders. Yet, you could just see it. It didn't take long for the paparazzi and the media to follow him wherever he went. Even when he tried to get away for a private moment, they were always there. Word would get out, and soon supporters, critics, and the curious surrounded him. But a person of Jesus' stature, notoriety, and, and power is not only surrounded by supporters cheering calls for freedom and carrying placards, and by critics who listen to his every word and, and watch his every move and try to trip him up, he's also shadowed by the desperate. The desperate people like those living on our streets and in our churches. People who have no other place to turn but fall at the feet of someone who may just have the power to change their lives. Well, as Matthew tells it, there was one such woman today. Jesus was in Tyre, another stop on his way. He was probably walking, shaking hands, kissing babies, teaching about God's kingdom, when this woman burst through the crowd and starts shouting, have mercy on me, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter, have mercy. My daughter is tormented by a demon. Jesus tried to ignore the woman because you can't engage with every enthusiast you come upon. It was a bit awkward for everyone there, though. This woman was shouting and pleading and causing a scene. People came to hear what Jesus was saying. They came to feel a part of something special, and this woman and her needs were ruining it. Here was the potential Messiah. He doesn't have time to help every hysterical person who comes along. The disciples knew this and tried to pull her aside and send her away because she was causing a commotion, ruining the event. But the distressed woman was persistent and kept on shouting, Jesus, have mercy. Finally, Jesus had taken all he could take, and he says, listen, I'm here for the sick people of Israel. For you see, the woman was an asylum seeker in a way, a foreigner, a Canaanite, and therefore not his concern. After all, he was the Jewish Messiah. He was the Messiah of Israel, 
We have to take care of our own first, he says. It was the patriotic, pragmatic, political thing to say. I'm here for Israel, not for you. Well, you can't blame the woman for trying. She had heard speeches about mercy and love for all, and she thought that all included her. She had heard about health care and education for all children, and she thought that included her daughter. She had heard that God loved the world so much, and she thought that included her. She had heard that this man, Jesus, had said, blessed are the meek and the poor in spirit and those who mourn. And she thought maybe for once she would receive a blessing instead of a curse for being each one of those. She had heard that Jesus said, let the children come to me. And she thought her child could also come. But this woman was not included in the all, and neither was her daughter. She was a Gentile. She was a Canaanite. She was not born of Abraham, and therefore she had nothing to do with the Messiah, and the Messiah ought not have anything to do with her. A nation has to look after its own. A race has to look after its own. A, a religion has to look after its own. Jesus knew this, and so he told the woman, I'm here for Israel, not for you. But the desperate woman fell before him, looked at him with desperate pleading eyes, and begged, help me. Please, Jesus, help me. I don't know about you, but I find it increasingly more easy to say no to requests for charity over the phone because all you have to reject is a voice. And it's even easier to ignore pleas for help that come in the mail because all you have to do is pretend that the letter never came. It's easy to say no to universal cries for help that are directed to no one in particular, but you happen to see it on television. All you have to do is change the channel and go to bed. But it's harder to say no when you have to actually see the person who is suffering. It's harder to say no when they're right there in front of you, living in the streets of your city, sleeping in your churches, and you have to acknowledge their humanity. It's harder to say no when you actually hear the voice and see the desperation in their eyes as they search for compassion and humanity in your eyes. It's hard to deny help to such people. But seemingly, Jesus had no problem saying no on this day. Is this the same Jesus who welcomes sinners, prostitutes, and tax collectors? Is this the same Jesus who said yes to children and lepers and blind beggars, yet he says no to this woman and her daughter? She falls on her knees and pleads, help me. And Jesus says, your faith is great. And with that, Matthew tells us her daughter was healed. How much humiliation can people take? How much pain do people have to suffer? How much do people have to be rejected? This woman was not asking to be made wealthy. She's not asking to be made wonderful and wise. She's asking for her daughter back. She has seen and heard Jesus do this. She just needs one small thing, pennies a day, crumbs off the table. She knows that Jesus can help. She knows that he has the power to change her life. 
And so in her persistence, she demonstrates her faith and God blesses her. Finally, the good news comes through. With all of that in our minds, what do you think when I say the words Israel and Palestine, Ukraine and Russia, Syria and Libya, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Somalia, India and Pakistan? And what do you think and feel when I say Muslim, Christian, and Jew, Quebecois, and Anglophone? And what do you think about all of that when you hear the Gospel of Matthew? Is it a story you don't want beggars on the street to hear in case they learn that persistence pays off? which will lead them to following you and asking for help? Is it primarily a story about Jesus' prejudice of another race, religion, or nationality? Or is it about faith, great faith, a story about inclusion, a story about breaking down barriers, a story about justice for all? Lots of questions. And while you struggle with those questions, let me just ask and conclude with two more. Is it right to give the children's bread to dogs? In other words, is it right to give our time and talents and money and resources to those who are not part of our family, to those who are not part of our church or our city? or our nation, or our religion, or our race? Is it right to give people who are not one of us an equal share, even crumbs for that matter? Is it right? And second, who are the children? Are our children only those whom we have somehow contributed to biologically? Are our children only those that sleep under our roof or go out to play at, at godly play? Or are the children those whom we have decided to take responsibility for? Are our children those who may look different from us but go to school with our kids? They may speak a different language but ride on our buses and subways. They may worship in a different manner, but they work and pay taxes to contribute to our nation and our economy. Who are our children? These are the questions I think are posed by scripture and challenge our churches and politicians and our nations to respond. Is it right? Who are our children? When I read a story like this, I, I, I like to imagine what Jesus would do if he was right here with us today and that same woman came and begged him for help. Although he could probably recite it uh, from his memory, he might humor us and reach up to the lectern of the pulpit and pull down a Bible and flip through the pages and land at the book of Psalms and then share these words with these women. Psalm 85. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak. For God will speak peace to the people, to the faithful, to those who turn to God in their hearts. Surely God's salvation is at hand for those who fear God, that God's glory may dwell in the land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good and our land will in increase its yield. Righteousness will go before her and will make a path for her steps. 
Perhaps that psalm caused Jesus to stop and reflect, who is this woman? And how shall I respond to her pleas for help? May God help us to think about this this week. Maybe you could flip through the Gospels and read some passages and, and read your email and decide what Jesus' answer might be. Who are the children? And is it right? Amen. Let us pray. Living God, people of all places and times have reached out to you in times of desperation. With so many needs, you have compassion for each one, and so we thank you for the depth of your love. This day, we set before you our many different hopes and concerns. Fill us with your compassion as we pray from the breadth and depth of our lives. We pray for all that we are and all that we do, for all we wish we could do, and all we long for. We pray for everything we work for in our church and community, and everything we hope for in the face of so much change. We pray for the choices we face in our country and community, in our homes and workplaces, and for all the responsibilities we bear in our different roles. We pray for the troubles that weary us 
the situations that puzzle us and the uncertainty that surrounds us. We remember before you each situation that worries us and each person we care about. Living Christ, you are the source of peace and new possibility for all, us all. Help us to trust in your grace for today and tomorrow. Fill us with the strength and hope we need to walk with you, united in your love. For it is as your loyal followers we dare to pray the words you taught us by saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And deliver us from temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Giving and gratitude are antidotes for anxious brains and a new cycle that tells us there's never enough. With God, there is always enough. In Christ's love, we respond with generosity and with faith. The offering will now be received, and those of you present and those of you at home can think about how you want to respond to the good news of God's love. Streams make glad the 
Thank you, Jennifer and Deb, for reminding us that God is our refuge and strength, and because of that, we can do amazing things in God's name. Let us present our offering and share the prayer together. Holy One, bless our offerings and transform them into compassion for others, community for the lonely, and hope for the church and the world. Amen. We are in the midst of one of the worst hunger crises in 40 years. 811 million people around the world are going hungry every night. Today, I'm chatting with T. Van Wong, the United Church Program Coordinator for Sustainable Development and Humanitarian Response, about how your generosity helps our United Church to respond to emergencies, including the current hunger crisis. T. Van, I'm really glad to be with you today. Thanks, Alexa. I'm really happy to be here today, too. Can you tell me how Mission and Service and our emergency response efforts have been helping both uh, here in Canada and around the world? So Mission and Service is supporting global partners in their response to food insecurity in their communities. When a hurricane hits Cuba or the super typhoon hits the Philippines, partners mobilize quickly to respond in their communities with food, hygiene kits, psychosocial support, and shelter. So partners are best placed to respond uh, to and understand the needs of the community the best. Um, so this not quite emergency response, but through Mission and Service as well, and through our membership with the Canadian Food Grains Bank and the Manitoba Council for International Cooperation, partners are doing the long-term work to address uh, food insecurity and hunger in their communities. Uh, for example, through conservation agriculture and agroecology. Uh, the National Council of Churches of Kenya are providing um, conservation agriculture trainings to smallholder farmers, particularly women farmers, and connecting them to more experienced um, women farmers that provides mentorship and support. They are also linking farmers to markets so that they can sell what they grow at a fair price. The impact of that is that farmers can uh, earn income to support their children's education and other household needs and improve their family's nutrition with um, Zimbabwe Council of Churches. They've been able to um, address gender-based violence within their communities. So um, issues such as early child marriages are prevented. So because of food um, security, people are able to farm, able to earn income um, so that they don't have to send their girl children for early marriages because they can't afford to feed them anymore. That's a significant impact. That, uh, that folks over here can help by, uh, by donating through mission and service. I'm um, amazed at how when we all pull together in one part of the world, we can affect change um, globally. Your gift for mission and service will help address both the immediate and long-term emergency response efforts. Good morning, everybody. Uh, if we haven't connected, uh, my name is Scott, and I'm the ministry coordinator here at Islington United. Uh, just a few announcements we have this morning. I just want to extend thanks to Reverend Mark and Reverend Minnie for, uh, and Dr. Deb for leading us this morning. Uh, Jason Locke and James Aitchison will be back next week leading worship. Uh, rummage sale items continue to be dropped off every Sunday, 9.30, at the back double doors. And mark your calendars for our fall kickoff Sunday and barbecue. Meet new people, connect with church leaders, discover ways that you can make a difference. Don't forget, we're walking the walk for social justice October 14th and 15th, and uh, we invite you to join us for our next practice walk, which will be right after service on September 10th. For the next 30 days, 
the volunteer leaders and staff of our congregation will be praying daily together as we act as stewards of the resources God has placed in this community and as we prepare the 2023-2024 annual budget for the October 11th annual general meeting. These devotions have been curated by Reverend Maya and will ground us theologically as a community of faith. And personally, they will help us navigate the fact that money, something we use daily and something we all make choices about. Money, a way to track what's important to us. Money, a blessing and a stress. Money, a tool for a generous life. Money is a resource that needs prayer and attention. If you would like to join us, please email ministry at islingtonunited.org or tell me today after service and I'll put you on the list to receive one devotion with Bible verse and prayer daily in your inbox from August 21st to September 19th. Pray on. Before the hymn, <clears throat> I just wanted to say that Alexa, who was in that video, is the person who sent me the email yesterday. And so I think all of that comes together to encourage us to think about how God is going to lead us and use us and guide us to share God's love in the world. Our closing hymn is God Who Gives to Life Its Goodness. The psalmist declares, it is good and pleasant when God's people live in unity. So go with the conviction that we can serve together to do good and to find pleasure in Jesus' name. And as you go, may the peace of Christ, our Savior, the love of God, our Creator, and the amazing presence of God, the Holy Spirit, be with you and remain with you this day and forever. Amen.